Next, Ernestine Schlant, author, professor, and wife of former presidential candidate Bill Bradley, discusses themes from her latest book, The Language of Silence. She explores how non-Jewish German authors have written about the Holocaust in the post-World War II era. She speaks for about 40 minutes. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, all the way up to not ten. That's how Jews count to make sure that we have 10 Jews to constitute a minion, the minimum number needed for public prayer. Why do we count in such a strange way? It goes back to this week's Torah portion, which begins with the command to take a census of the Israelites. And then Moses is told how to count, not by counting people, but by having each person donate a half a shekel and then counting the number of half shekels. The lesson we learn from this kind of counting is very important. People are not numbers. When people are treated as numbers, we end up with numbers like the six million. Six million Jews treated as numbers by the Nazis, and millions of other human beings who also didn't count. The other lesson that we learn from this week's Torah portion is that individuals should count. They should count to make a difference in the world, to challenge indifference, and to question silence. That's why I'm delighted to introduce our speaker on this Sabbath evening, a woman who for more than 35 years has been a college professor teaching German and comparative literature. As a German scholar, she recently published her third book, The Language of Silence, which examines the work of post-war German authors as they attempt to deal or not to deal with the subject of the Holocaust. It's a topic the New York Times recently wrote that she took on from the beginning of her adult consciousness because it challenged to the core her own identity. Ernestine Schlant Bradley has managed to balance the demands of her personal and professional life while being the wife of a widely known professional athlete and United States Senator. She's not only a wife, but also a mother and a grandmother, an educator, an author, and a cancer survivor. She's a woman who conceived and chaired an annual event in New Jersey called the Unsung Heroines Award, which recognized women who count, whose everyday work was vital to the well-being of their communities and their neighborhoods. Dr. Ernestine Schlant Bradley is a woman who counts. On behalf of Temple Emmanuel, it is my pleasure to introduce her to all of you. Rabbi Geller, thank you very much. And I want to say I'm, I'm deeply honored and very pleased that so many people are here. I know it was on short notice. And, and so it's a great compliment that you wanted to come and listen to what I have to say. I met a few people earlier today, so it's, it's a good company. Let me uh, speak about my book and let me, and, and the theme actually from what Rabbi Geller said will emerge in what I have to say, namely the counting one by one by one. 
but that's sort of anticipating. The basic uh, premise of my analysis of literature, of West German literature, not East German, not Austrian, only West German literature, which means the literature from about 49 until 1990, a little bit beyond 1990. Uh, the basic premise is that literature, because it is a creative act, has to delve into the unconscious. It reveals, even sometimes the writers don't know that, but it reveals unconsciously held values and assumptions that, you know, the people may not be aware of. So I think, in a way, literature tells a truth that is not necessarily the truth that the writer thinks he or she is saying. But that is a truth that comes out, and of course, with literary analysis and literary techniques, you can take the text apart and you can point out where the silences are. Uh, Maxine, I think you had a book here. Is she here? Could I use the... Okay, thank you so much. What I want to say is, those of you who have been to Berlin, I don't know who has been to Berlin, outside the Grunewald train station in Berlin, this is where the trains left for Auschwitz. And there is now a monument. It's I don't know how high, it's a cement wall. And cut into the cement wall are these outlines of figures. You can tell they are human shapes, but the figures are not there. And you need the cement wall, the presence of the cement wall, to see the absence of the people. I took their picture when I was in Berlin because it's a visualization. And, and what I wanted to do is treat the literary text like a cement wall and delineate and outline the areas of silence where you can say this is where the writer doesn't push. This is where the silence takes place. So in a sense, you know, maybe this is a, a good way of visualizing what I'm trying to do. And what I found is that between... Uh, 49, the Constitution of West Germany, and the 90s, there are about four generations of writers. Every 15 years, a new generation started to write. The first generation, which goes until about 59, 1960, is that generation that really participated, certainly in the war, if we want a euphemism, and in the Holocaust if they admit it, but usually it's called the Nazi regime and the Holocaust is subsumed, but that's already an instance of silence. And I want to just give you a very brief flavor of some of the symbolism, the circumlocutions, the circumscriptions. It's by a writer, I don't know whether some of you know Heinrich Böll, he won the uh, Nobel Prize in 72. And he had a story, it's called Across the Bridge, where a war veteran comes home after the war and he reminisces how before the war, and you realize all the euphemisms I use, the bridge was very strong and very sturdy, and now it's just a track across an abyss. But, and if you interpret symbolically, he already says, one side of the, the river that the bridge uh, goes across resembles the other side. So you already know the Nazi regime and the post-war period are not that different, even though the abyss, the tracks lead across the abyss. That's a kind of symbolism. <clears throat> and then he says, well, I don't know, you know, I was innocent, what did I do? I was only a messenger, I carried messages twice or three times a week, and I, I wouldn't know what was in those folders that I carried because I wasn't supposed to ask. And you get, you know, the very kind of exculpatory incantations that you have heard, you know, for, for decades. And then comes the sentence where he says, the only thing I know about these folders is that their color was yellow. Now, you know, yellow is not an innocent color in Germany, and it certainly was not at the end of the 40s. You know, it was uh, the Star of David. So up until that time, if you don't understand the significance of yellow, 
It means nothing to you. The whole story is just a story of a war veteran coming home. But if you know the significance of the color yellow, suddenly that story becomes a confession. When he says, I didn't know what was in the folders. I only carried out my duty. I only did what I was told. You know, then you understand what he is trying to do. And there are quite a number of, you know, stories and novels that act on that plane and you have to understand and be able to read between the lines. I just wanted you to, you know, get a little bit what they were trying to do. <coughs> or for example, I, you know, Böll at one time did write about a concentration camp. The concentration camp commander, you know, they're all stereotypes, has a very intelligent forehead, but a very brutal chin. And then he, we go into the pathology and into the stereotypes. He was a musician, so people had to sing. And if they were in his choir, their lives were spared. And if they were not in the choir, then they were immediately killed. And what you get there is the desire to talk, but the incapacity to do it in anything but stereotypes. You know, there was, there is really, and so you know if he really, if Böll really had any exposure to concentration camps, which he has never been quite clear about, then you know that he could not look at the people as human beings, but only as stereotypes or as numbers, as numbers, no names. But then, from about 1960 on, and of course you know, 1960, the, Aus uh, the uh, Eichmann trial in Jerusalem, and from 63 to 65, the Auschwitz trials in Frankfurt, they changed the discourse. Because, you know, the Auschwitz trials were carried in the newspapers and were discussed and debated, and it, it was a time when at least the media talked even though the people themselves didn't really want to know. But what really happened there was, and as a writer, what I find a little bit of a cop-out is that, for example, Hochut, some of you may have seen at the time a play called The Deputy. And The Deputy, of course, where the Pope gets implicated, where the, you know, where, where the focus is a little bit taken away from Germans only. And then there was a play by, <coughs> excuse me, I have a little cough, uh, by Peter Weiss, which was called The Investigation. You may also have seen that, which is really the transcripts of the Auschwitz trials. So you do have the victims and the defendants and the prosecutors in, in all, you know, in their court language. But what I found interesting, but really not uh, satisfying is, that if you use the language of court transcripts, you do not have to dig up your own language. You do not have to delve. What you are is more or less an editor of court records. And of course, although that allows you to speak about the Holocaust, at the same time, it allows you to keep a distance because it's really not your language. And those of you who may have seen the investigation, you know, Peter Weiss's play, Peter Weiss was himself a refugee from Nazi Germany, but he was also a Marxist. And a Marxist thesis, of course, was, and this is now, think about it, 64, 65, when we have the civil rights movement, when the protests against the war in Vietnam begin. And, and Peter Weiss says, well, Fascism is the ultimate outcome of capitalism. And so, of course, down with capitalism, which was also a very anti-American attitude then. And so that fascism almost became the agent for the Holocaust, rather than, as Rabbi Geller says, one by one by one, the individuals. So you have a text you have very much transcripts of the atrocities. And yet, from my point of view, 
you are still, you know, almost like working with stereotypes. You are working with material that has already been prepared for you, and you can sort of work with that without really having to dig very deeply into your soul. The, and this is called in literary history the documentary literature, which started with 1960 with the documents of the Eichmann trial, the last of the, well, the last, as far as I know, of the plays about the Eichmann trial was published in 1988 by a writer who called the play Brother, uh, Brother Hitler because of the, you know, the emotional involvement with the perpetrators. So the documentary literature goes into the 80s, and it starts in the 60s. It overlaps with the symbolic uh, um, literature. And then comes the third generation. The third generation starts to write about the middle of the 1970s. And that is the generation that was born either at the end of the Nazi regime or afterwards. It's the first generation that could say, could say, you know, they were no longer the perpetrators. And they had nothing to do, they were born after 45, and now they need to look at the Holocaust. And what these novels do, and there are hundreds and hundreds of these novels, literally, these are novels by these younger writers who look back. And in order to find a kind of a self-definition who is this generation of Germans? They look back at the Holocaust, and they look back at the role that their parents played during the Holocaust. And this category of novels then goes down as autobiographical fiction. It's a kind of a hybrid because it's not straight autobiography. It's sort of fictionalized because I think the fiction then allows, again, you know, autobiography is much more direct. So if we get the context with fiction, we can mix truth and fiction a little bit, and it's easier to write about it. And these novels span, I think, one of the, well, worst. It, it's almost an orgy of hatred. And it is written, or it was written, uh, by a contemporary journalist by the name of Niklas Frank, whose father was Hans Frank who was the governor general of Poland, who oversaw all the extermination camps in Poland. And there is his son now writing, and Hans Frank, of course, was executed at the Nuremberg trials. And, and Nicholas Frank now writes about his father in an orgy of hatred. You know, being stuck with such a history, with such a legacy, with such a father, and, and many of the others of these hundreds of novels have maybe not as, as vituperatively uh, um, an anger. Only very few, and I should mention the other extreme, a young woman who wrote about her father who was a Protestant minister, but who also fell short. And, and by talking about the Protestant minister, the daughter who writes this novel also brings in the role of the Protestant churches during the Nazi regime. So she has a wider background. But all of these novels look at their parents. They are women and men who write, and they look at their fathers primarily, but also at their mothers. But what strikes me in these novels now, the Holocaust is very, very much a center of focus. You know, what did you do, father, mother? But the Holocaust is used as an instrument, and the literary term is instrumentalized, is used as an instrument in a generational battle. And you know, generational battles have been going on, and literature has very often uh, uh, traced the distances, the differences between generations. For that generation in Germany, the Holocaust becomes the watershed. But, and this is, and I look again at Rabbi Geller because of the numbers, the Holocaust is a global term. You know, where the children ask their parents, what did you do in the Holocaust? What was your role in the Holocaust? You know, were you a Nazi? What did you do? But the Holocaust is not individualized. 
You know, it's a term that has maybe six million attached, but it is not something that can really look at individual suffering or at individual pain. And as long as it is a global term, you know, you can deal with it more easily because you do not have to look at the individuals that were implicated and that were destroyed. So that generation talks about the Holocaust very much, uses the Holocaust as an instrument, really in an inter-German generational battle, again completely ignoring the fact that the Holocaust meant the lives of Jews and of others and of individuals. So that's the third generation. The fourth generation begins, <clears throat> and we talked a little bit about it before, um, really in 1985. 1985, as you know, is the year of Bitburg. It is and then, uh, of course, where for the first time there are Jews in Germany who demonstrate and who say, not again, not this way. We have a voice, and we want our voice to be heard as individuals. 1986, from then on for, for the next 10, 15 years, there is a controversy almost every year. 1986, there is the so-called historian's controversy. Again, very publicly carried out in German newspapers where the battle between the revisionists and, and the other historians was, is the Holocaust a unique experience or is it comparable to the gulag and to other genocides? Now, this again, a major controversy that extended almost over a year, of course. The parties did not really come to any conclusion, but the debate was carried on in public. And, and that, so, so, you know, that the realization of the Holocaust was ever greater. In 86, also, there was a play by a German playwright by the name of, of Fassbinder, who has done a lot of movies, and I'm sure some of you may have seen The Marriage of Eva Brown and, and whatnot. And he wrote a play that was fairly construed, and I think was justification, as anti-Semitic. And it was supposed to be performed in Frankfurt. And again, the Jewish community in Frankfurt, not only did they boycott the play, they never, well, they never allowed the play to be performed. They sat in, up on stage, they had sit-ins, they had protests. Again, it was a big thing carried on in the papers. Ultimately, the play was not performed. Of course, then the question came up, well, freedom of speech. And, and so all of this was worked out, well, not really with a solution, but it came out. And the good thing is that it again brought the Holocaust to the foreground. In 88, 50th anniversary of the Kristallnacht, the night of, of broken glass, um, was the first time, now this is, when you think of it, 88 is almost 45 years after the conclusion of, of the Nazi, well, the conclusion, the defeat of the Nazi regime, the conclusion of World War II. <coughs> the um, president of the German parliament at that time wanted to give a speech commemorating the night of broken glass and tried to recreate the atmosphere and the language in which German citizens who happened to be Jewish, but they were German citizens who happened to be Jewish were, you know, the atmosphere to which they were exposed to the vituperation, to the hatred. And because he wasn't a very skilled speaker, people thought he was speaking from his heart instead of that he was quoting what the atmosphere was like. Well, he became so embarrassed that he resigned from the presidency of the German parliament, and then by the time it was all sorted out, uh, they wanted to make up the year afterwards. By that time, unification was on the rise. But what is important here, again, I find that he was trying to break the taboo of the Nazi language, which had still not been broken. You know, it, and, and the fact that it 
had such tremendous repercussions shows you, you know, how much the attempt was to forget the language rather than to be horrified at what the language is. You know, rather don't talk about it almost 45 years afterwards. And then, you know, we had unification. And let me just say one more thing about unification. There were two writers, Günter Krass and Martin Walser. And a question as intimately connected with the German identity was, should we be a unified country or should we not? I mean, that's a, an, an, an intra-German question. Yet the measure that was used to solve this situation was the Holocaust. This time the question was, as Günter Grass said, every time Germany was unified, you know, for 1870 and then down to uh, 45, Germany brought on two world wars and untold suffering and atrocities. Therefore, Günter Grass said, Germany should never be unified. Let's have a federation, let's have some accommodations, but let's keep East and West Germany se uh, separate. Martin Walser, on the contrary, said, well, you know, the Germans, this is now 1990, the Germans have been good allies in NATO, they have been good allies of the United States, and he said, and if we have not been able to prove that we have mended, that we have really been sorry, that we really are now good Democrats, then by all means, you know, let's not have unification, but sort of, I dare you to tell us, you know, Martin Walser would say, that we are not good Democrats now. And so therefore, he uh, thought that uh, unification should be okay. But the interesting thing is that for two Germans to decide whether or not Germany should be unified, the Holocaust was the measure. But the Holocaust still as a global term. And only in the last few years now, and actually I shouldn't even exaggerate, one novel really uh, has been written, it's been translated into English, it's called The Emigrants, and it is the first novel. Uh, the the uh, writer, his name is Sebald, S-E-B-A-L-D, and in German it's called Die Ausgewanderten, not Die Auswanderer, Die Ausgewanderten. And it is the first novel of genuine mourning and sorrow. It is a novel that even, you know, when, when the Holocaust is not in the foreground of the discussion, it is a novel that is suffused with mourning, with melancholy, with sadness. You know, it's almost like if you have lost someone and your basic attitude is that you are sad, you can still smile and you can still go on, but fundamentally you are sad and you are in mourning. And this is what this novel is. And what the author does is he not only mourns individual Jewish lives, which he does, but he also mourns a tradition that has been destroyed and a culture that has been destroyed. And he managed to solve a problem that a lot of other preceding authors had said, well, you know, we, is it really appropriate for a non-Jewish German to write about Jewish suffering? Isn't that almost like a sacrilege, you know? The Jews should talk about the suffering. He finds a solution. And what he does, he's non-Jewish. So how can he write about Jewish suffering with the respect and with the mourning that it deserves? And he has one of his heroes escape to England as a young boy. There were these children's transports that went from Germany to England before 39. And the parents no longer managed to escape. This is in 39. So the mother, knowing what is going to happen, she sits down and she writes, and it is such a moving document, she writes with all the love and affection of what it meant to be Jewish in Germany to the, during the Weimar Republic and before. And this 
document of her youth, of her parents, of growing up in Germany. Now, I don't know whether it's a fictitious document which the author made up or whether it's an authentic one. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. The point is that it is an expression of a tradition as it was still alive by somebody on, on the verge of extinction looking back so that when the son after, after 45 receives his mother's package with all these reminiscences, when the mother has already died and the father, it is almost a, a resurrection of the culture and of the lives, but a resurrection in what only art can do. The reality has been destroyed, but the reality has been kept alive in the work of art. The art is the only thing that is left, which is, of course, a tremendously, tremendously sad comment. But at the same time, it is also the document that preserves. And, and that's why it is so moving. It shows the destruction. It shows the one by one by one destruction and the suffering. But at the same time, it, it preserves the suffering and it preserves the culture and the tradition. And that's what I find. Hopefully, we will have more novels when the young generations come up, who are the next 15-year group now who will start to write. So I hope that's the first one. Sebald, S-E-B-A-L-D. W.G. Sebald, Winfried Georg, I think. We'd like to take 15 minutes for questions, and I would like you to watch me carefully as I walk over to this microphone here, because all the questions should be directed into this microphone, I don't know. I don't think so. and yet they should be loud so that we all can hear it as I'm speaking now, okay? So what will happen is, if you'd like to speak, please raise your hand to ask a question, and then come up to this microphone. This microphone is not to the speakers in the room, but please come up and use the microphone and a loud voice at the same time. Is there anyone that has any questions? Okay, thank you very much. I, I thought your talk was fascinating. And actually, I have, a, I have a couple of questions um, that came to me as, as I was listening to you. First of all, I'm, I'm wondering, listening to you talking about novels versus theater, and then you mentioned Fassbinder, <laughs> if in some ways the more exploratory work where people, maybe artists are more courageous about asking some of these questions, in, at least in terms of West German um, artists, maybe isn't in literature, but is more in cinema and also in the visual arts. I think about Anselm Kiefer, yeah. and I think also about, um, I think some of the work of Wim Wenders and in what he does in yes. Der Himmel über Berlin, um, Wings of Desire, where he seems to me to be asking questions about who is missing and... and Yes. Well, the question about is that. about, uh, you know, the relation of literature in speci you know, specifically right. novels as opposed to drama right. or film. Right. Um, I, I am not so sure that Wim Wenders, you know, the questions are being asked, mm -hmm. but I do not think that the mourning, and I am really looking for the mourning, for the expression right. of sorrow, right. you know, it, the general, the kind of global knowledge of the Holocaust right. is there. And then also what, you know, what I would like to say is, particularly in relation to drama, you have the documentary, you have a pre-fashioned language. Mm -hmm. And what I also would like to say, because you mentioned Anselm Kiefer, who is a major painter, who I was in, in uh, Seattle recently, where uh, I had the great privilege of meeting an artist, a woman, <sighs> who is mostly doing uh, Holocaust, uh, um, how should I say, trauma in her art. And she and I both agreed that it is very easy to see Anselm Kiva, I don't know whether any of you know, he's a German painter, as a reactionary, actually. 
You could very easily. You. Yes, it's it's slippery. I agree. It's very. My, yes. my second question, and again, it, 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 I'm really asking you to speculate um, about about the what differences there are, if there are any, between these explorations uh, in West Germany and East Germany and mm -hmm. Austria. I, I do some work on Peter Hanske, and he ah, yes. has had interesting things to say about the Holocaust. Not sentimental things, but, but pretty honest things about himself Did you read Wunschloses Unglück? Yes. Yeah, yeah, where you have right. it, right. you know. So, so I was wondering what kind of dif differences, if any, do you see All right. between those, those the nations? The difference between West German literature, East German literature, and Austrian literature. I think when you, you know, compare these three German language literatures, I think West German literature has been most forthcoming. You know, not, not maybe in the way that we wanted, but I think there is no self-respecting writer in, in West Germany who did not in one way or another circumvent the Holocaust, but circumventing it is already admitting that it existed. In East Germany, which is of course a Marxist society, uh, after 45, people went to the so-called anti-fa, anti-fascist schools where they converted to Marxism. And since they were then Marxists, they could take big exception to what happened in fascism and in the Hitler regime. Uh, there is one writer that I find very respectable. Her name is Christa Wolf. Yes, right. And That's she did I was thinking, I was thinking of Kindheitsmuster, actually, exactly. and how interesting And that, that novel, yeah. where she really, yeah. I think it would fall into the category of the generational novels, where the younger generation looks back at the parents and in those generational novels, in that autobiographical fiction, the interesting thing, and that's what Christa Wolf also does, is, you know, the men just tear away at their fathers. The women look at their parents, but they bring their children in. Most of these novels, where the writer is a woman, then says, how can I explain to my child what happened so you have almost three generations brought in, which is very good. But Christa Wolf is really the only one. Then in East German literature, do we have time? I don't know. In East German literature, you also have a lot of former, well, former, yeah, uh, German Jews who were Marxists or socialists and who left, many of them went to Mexico and to other parts, and who then came back to East Germany and wrote in East Germany. And so you have a little bit more of, of, of almost survival literature. And then you have Jurek Becker, who was also a survivor, who stayed in East Germany because of political persuasions, and who is one of the early ones who writes about surviving in Germany in concentration camps and then surviving in East Germany after the war. Austrian literature is a story all by itself, <laughs> never mind Peter Hanke, who I think isn't too concerned, frankly, with the Holocaust either, except for Wunschloses Unglück. You know, Austria likes to think of itself as having been annexed, right, right. right. in 38. And that sort of gave it an excuse after 45 to say, well, we were victims too. And then, of course, because it, Austria was predominantly occupied by the Russian zone, it had a separate peace treaty, it didn't have to look at itself that closely. West Germany had. West Germany, from 53 on, you know, could not become a respectable member among other nations if it didn't start, you know, reparations and restitution uh, talks with Israel at the time with Konrad Adenauer and Ben-Gurion. Austria didn't have to do that. Austria started, though, I would say, with Peter Hanke, with the generation that started to write around 1970s. And they have been hammering away at their parents, I think, from then on. Or when you think of Thomas Bernhardt, you know, who really, really has made it his mission to, to make Austria unhappy about the fact that it has not talked about its Nazi past. Thank you very yeah. much. That was a big question. <laughs> oh, I'm coming. Um. I, have a, I have a question about the silence in American literature following the war. What happened 
between 45 and 63 with American literature and, and Jewish, Jewish American fiction regarding the war. I mean, there is Cynthia You mean Ozen. regarding the Holocaust? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, this is an, and I have a, a kind of a chapter, an introductory chapter in my book about that, where I say there are two kinds of silences. The silence of the Holocaust and the silence about the Holocaust. And when you read Holocaust, you know, survival literature, you find to a large extent that there is a silence, or for a while there is a silence, because the victims are so traumatized. And then there is the debate, uh, or there was a debate in American literature, should one talk about it? George Steiner said, you know, let's not even talk about it. Let's not dignify, you know, the Nazi crimes with language. And then there is the school with La Lawrence Langer, who says, never mind how inadequate the language is, you know, because language can never, never express the atrocities of the Holocaust. But never mind how inadequate the language is. We need to give voice. We need to bring it out. We need to speak always with the understanding that we can never really speak it. We only can speak about it or around it. Yeah, but there were silences. And the it very was 20 interesting years. I mean, I it, was, it was 20 years of, of silence from I th pretty much, you know, from, from America. When did Elie Wiesel start to write? I think that was a little earlier, though. Uh, yeah, I think it was a little earlier. But still, but you know, there was silence. And even if there's one writer, overall, there was much more silence than there is now. That's true. Yeah. I'm very sorry we do not have enough time for any more questions. I'd like to thank Dr. Bradley one more time for coming thank here. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. A great to be here. Thank you. Ernestine Schlant is a professor of German at New Jersey's Montclair State University, where she's taught since 1971. She's the wife of former Democratic presidential candidate Bill Bradley. The Language of Silence is published by Routledge. Next, Ernestine Schlant, author, professor, and wife of former presidential candidate Bill Bradley, discusses themes from her latest book, The Language of Silence. She explores how non-Jewish German authors have written about the Holocaust in the post-World War II era. She speaks for about 40 minutes. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, all the way up to not ten. That's how Jews count, to make sure that we have ten Jews to constitute a minion, the minimum number needed for public prayer. Why do we count in such a strange way? It goes back to this week's Torah portion, which begins with the command to take a census of the Israelites. And then Moses is told how to count, not by counting people, but by having each person donate a half a shekel and then counting the number of half shekels. The lesson we learn from this kind of counting is very important. People are not numbers. When people are treated as numbers, we end up with numbers like the six million. Six million Jews treated as numbers by the Nazis and millions of other human beings who also didn't count. The other lesson that we learn from this week's Torah portion is that individuals should count. They should count to make a difference in the world, to challenge indifference, and to question silence. 
That's why I'm delighted to introduce our speaker on this. But if you know the significance of the color yellow, suddenly that story becomes a confession. When he says, I didn't know what was in the folders. I only carried out my duty. I only did what I was told. You know, then you understand what he is trying to do. And there are quite a number of, you know, stories and novels that act on that plane and you have to understand and be able to read between the lines. I just wanted you to, you know, get a little bit what they were trying to do. <coughs> or for example, I, you know, Böll at one time did write about a concentration camp. The concentration camp commander, you know, they're all stereotypes, has a very intelligent forehead, but a very brutal chin. And then he, we go into the pathology and into the stereotypes. He was a musician, so people had to sing. And if they were in his choir, their lives were spared. And if they were not in the choir, then they were immediately killed. And what you get there is the desire to talk, but the incapacity to do it in anything but stereotypes. You know, there was, there is really, and so you know if he really, if Böll really had any exposure to concentration camps, which he has never been quite clear about, then you know that he could not look at the people as human beings, but only as stereotypes or as numbers, as numbers, no names. But then, from about 1960 on, and of course you know, 1960, the, Aus uh, the uh, Eichmann trial in Jerusalem, and from 63 to 65, the Auschwitz trials in Frankfurt, they changed the discourse. Because, you know, the Auschwitz trials were carried in the newspapers and were discussed and debated, and it, it was a time when at least the media talked even though the people themselves didn't really want to know. But what really happened there was, and as a writer, what I find a little bit of a cop-out is that, for example, Hochhut, some of you may have seen at the time a play called The, the Basic uh, Premise of my analysis of literature, of West German literature, not East German, not Austrian, only West German literature, which means the literature from about 49 until 1990, a little bit beyond 1990. Uh, the basic premise is that literature, because it is a creative act, has to delve into the unconscious. It reveals, even sometimes the writers don't know that, but it reveals unconsciously held values and assumptions that, you know, the people may not be aware of. So I think, in a way, literature tells a truth that is not necessarily the truth that the writer thinks he or she is saying. But that is a truth that comes out, and of course, with literary analysis and literary techniques, you can take the text apart and you can point out where the silences are. Uh, Maxine, I think you had a book here. Is she here? Could I use the... Co okay, thank you so much. What I want to say is, those of you who have been to Berlin, I don't know who has been to Berlin, outside the Grunewald train station in Berlin, this is where the trains left for Auschwitz, and there is now a monument. It's I don't know how high, it's a cement wall. And cut into the cement wall are these outlines of figures. You can tell they are human shapes, but the figures are not there. And you need the cement wall, the presence of the cement wall, to see the absence of the people. I took that picture when I was in Berlin because it's a visualization And, and what I wanted to do is treat the literary text like a cement wall and delineate and outline the areas of silence where you can say this is where the writer doesn't push, this is where the silence takes place. 
So in a sense, you know, maybe this is a, a good way of visualizing what I'm trying to do. And what I found is that between uh, 49, the Constitution of West Germany, and the 90s, there are about four generations of writers. Every 15 years, a new generation started to write. The first generation, which goes until about 59, 1960, is that generation that really participated, certainly in the war, if we want a euphemism, and in the Holocaust, if they admit it, but usually it's called the Nazi regime and the Holocaust is subsumed, but that's already an instance of silence. And I want to just give you a very brief flavor of some of the symbolism, the circumlocutions, the circumscriptions. It's by a writer, I don't know whether some of you know Heinrich Böll, he won the uh, Nobel Prize in 72. And he had a story, it's called Across the Bridge, where a war veteran comes home after the war and he reminisces how before the war, and you realize all the euphemisms I use, the bridge was very strong and very sturdy, and now it's just a track across an abyss. But, and if you interpret symbolically, he already says, one side of the, the river that the bridge uh, goes across resembles the other side. So you already know the Nazi regime and the post-war period are not that different, even though the abyss, the tracks lead across the abyss. That's a kind of symbolism. <coughs> and then he says, well, I don't know, you know, I was innocent, what did I do? I was only a messenger, I carried messages twice or three times a week, and I, I wouldn't know what was in those folders that I carried because I wasn't supposed to ask. And you get, you know, the very kind of exculpatory incantations that you have heard, you know, for, for decades. And then comes the sentence where he says, the only thing I know about these folders is that their color was yellow. Now, you know, yellow is not an innocent color in Germany, and it certainly was not at the end of the 40s. You know, it was the, the Star of David. So up until that time, if you don't understand the significance of yellow, it means nothing to you. The whole story is just a story of a war veteran coming home. Sabbath evening. A woman who for more than 35 years has been a college professor teaching German and comparative literature. As a German scholar, she recently published her third book, The Language of Silence, which examines the work of post-war German authors as they attempt to deal or not to deal with the subject of the Holocaust. It's a topic, the New York Times recently wrote, that she took on from the beginning of her adult consciousness because it challenged to the core her own identity. Ernestine Schlant Bradley has managed to balance the demands of her personal and professional life while being the wife of a widely known professional athlete and United States Senator. She's not only a wife, but also a mother and a grandmother, an educator, an author, and a cancer survivor. She's a woman who conceived and chaired an annual event in New Jersey called the Unsung Heroines Award, which recognized women who count whose everyday work was vital to the well-being of their communities and their neighborhoods. Dr. Ernestine Schlant Bradley is a woman who counts. On behalf of Temple Emmanuel, it is my pleasure to introduce her to all of you. Rabbi Geller, thank you very much. And I want to say I'm, I'm deeply honored and very pleased that so many people are here. I know it was on short notice, and, and so it's a great compliment that you wanted to come and listen to what I have to say. I met a few people earlier today, so it's, it's a 
good company. Let me uh, speak about my book and let me, and, and the theme actually from what Rabbi Geller said will emerge in what I have to say, namely the counting one by one by one. Uh, but that's sort of anticipating. 